Hi, I'm Ed Bacon, the rector of All Saints Church Pasadena. Whoever you are and wherever you find yourself on the journey of faith, I hope that you'll find something here that speaks to you. Welcome. Good morning, everyone. Thank you very much for being here. It's a very exciting and historic moment for us at All Saints Church to have the great Cecile Richards with us via Skype. I think this is the third Skype interview we've done at uh, All Saints Church, and it works beautifully. She's in an office in New York City. We are here. The camera will, uh, when we begin our conversation, the camera that is here will give her a, a sense of who is here in the room and the kind of energy that's here. Let me introduce her to us before we begin. Our speaker is a nationally respected leader in the field of women's health and reproductive rights as president of Planned Parenthood Federation of America and the Planned Parenthood Action Fund. Our speaker leads a national organization that has worked for nearly 100 years to build a healthier and safer world for women and teens. Every year, through nearly 800 affiliate health centers nationwide, Planned Parenthood provides health care services to nearly 3 million patients and sex education to more than 1. million people. Its website, PlannedParenthood.org, receives 33 million visits per year from individuals seeking health care services and education in both English and in Spanish. Since joining Planned Parenthood in 2006, Cecile Richards has expanded the organization's advocacy for access to health care and ensured that Planned Parenthood played a pivotal role in shaping health care coverage and services for women under the Affordable Care Act. In 2011, she led an unprecedented nationwide campaign to preserve access to um, Planned Parenthood's preventive care through federal programs. Under her leadership, the number of Planned Parenthood supporters has doubled, reaching more than six million. Um, and she's listening in, many of whom are in this room right here. Before joining Planned Parenthood, Cecile Richards served as Deputy Chief of Staff for House Democratic Leader Nancy Pelosi. In 2004, she founded and served as President of America Votes, a coalition of 42 national grassroots organizations working to maximize registration, education, and voter participation. She began her career organizing low-wage workers in the hotel, health care, and janitorial industries throughout California, Louisiana, and Texas. She's a frequent speaker and commentator on issues related to women's rights, reproductive health, sex education, and is a regular contributor to Huffington Post. She currently serves on the board of the Ford Foundation. She and her husband, Kirk Adams, have three children and reside in New York City. Will you warmly welcome Cecile Richards. Good morning. Thank you. <clears throat> Can you feel us? Excuse me? Can you feel us? Feel us. Can you feel us? And our... I can. All right. Sorry, there's a little delay, a little time delay here. That's okay. Even though this is... We'll roll with it. technology. We'll roll with it. It's great to okay. have you here. And we want to give you a few minutes to greet us uh, with some opening remarks, and then you and I are going to have a conversation. Fantastic. Welcome. Fantastic. Uh, well, thank you, Reverend Bacon, um, and thank you to All Saints for having me today. Um, I also want to acknowledge my friend and colleague, Sherry Bonner, who I think is there today. I can't see you, but uh, she's here. the CEO. She's here. She's there. Um, and also Juliana Serrano, who I know is also there and a member of the board of Planned Parenthood of Pasadena and San Gabriel um, Valley. Um, it's a real honor to be with you. Um, I'll just give a, a, a little bit of context to the conversation. I, um, I was born in Texas and uh, grew up there. And uh, Texas is a, it's a different place. Um, I grew up in uh, Dallas, Texas, and where my, um, well, my folks, my folks were actually born in Waco and um, grew up in Waco, went to, ba went to Baylor, which is a Baptist school, of course, 
where, as my mother said, everything they did was uh, more fun because it was either uh, a, against the rules or it was a sin. Um, and they just became social activists, uh, I think uh, probably as a result. Now, I grew up in Dallas where my brother and I um, went to the Unitarian Preschool. And in Dallas, you know, my folks were into every movement that came through town the women's movement, the civil rights movement, the farm workers. And quite honestly, it was the Unitarian Church where all of that was happening. Uh, and so for me, we thought of in Texas, church as a place that people came together to work um, and collaborate on issues of social justice. And I think it still is, and obviously it still is there in Pasadena. Um, unfortunately, as we all know, I think the past few decades, Increasingly, religion has been used uh, more as a weapon uh, against those who disagree with each other. Um, and in particular, we found this true in Texas um, back you know, with the founding of the Christian Coalition, which in Texas was our first experience with what was really a political movement that was using religion uh, as a way of advancing a, an extreme right-wing political agenda. And we had this experience as, the, as that organization began to organize to, um, against gay rights, against women's rights, uh, organize about what textbooks kids could read in the school system. And it became, a, a, it was quite alarming. Um, and in fact, in Austin, where I lived, the most common bumper sticker was, God, please protect me from your followers. That was sort of the sentiment. Um, and as a result, we actually organized the Texas Faith Network and Texas Freedom Network to bring together uh, people of good conscience, people from various faith traditions who believed in faith as something that could heal uh, the ills of society, not make them worse. Um, and it's really there, um, that was how I got to know some incredible religious leaders, including um, a lot of good folks in Texas, um, Reverend Larry Bethune, who was a pastor of the First Baptist Church, first openly uh, you know, welcoming gays and lesbians into that church, even at the risk of losing the church. Um, Father Bill Davis, uh, a fantastic, um, fantastic uh, Catholic priest who, was, uh, who joined us. And of course, it was how I got to know Reverend Dr. George Regas, who was such a pivotal uh, leader um, in, in, the, in, in bringing people together across the country. So, I just want to thank Dr. Regas right now for all he has done in his life. Um, so that's sort of my background in this work. And I think it's even more important now that people of faith, um, leaders and laity come together to advance the common good. And no more, more importantly, than in the area of equal access to healthcare in America. Um, so this morning, what I thought I'd do is just tell you a little bit about what has happened in this last year and what I think we're up against and why we have to organize across the country to not only protect but advance access to healthcare in America. Um, and I think when we do, um, we, will, we can and will stand up for the millions of women and young people who are relying on us for access to care. So before I do this, I want to just check, is the sound okay from your point of view? It's working perfectly. Right, everybody? Yeah, yeah we're with you all the way, Cecile. Okay. Um, I'll say, I actually, it's been a crazy week, um, and uh, I've actually seen the president three times this week, so I've sort of lost my voice um, shouting in enthusiasm for him, so bear with me. Um, what really has happened uh, here at Planned Parenthood is obviously in 2010 there was a big election in this country. And uh, when this new Congress was elected, um, even though it's so funny, you hear now folks say, well, there's no war on women. It's all part of our imagination. And yet if you look back, the very first House Resolution 1 of this new Congress uh, was the effort to completely end the national family planning program in America that provides five million women in this country with preventive health care. Okay, so it's not just something that we thought up ourselves. This was been this has been the agenda of this Congress since day one. Um, 
And I want to stress here, and this may be something that Sherry talks about, this bill had nothing to do with abortion. Because um, as we know, the Hyde Amendment has prevented federal funding for abortion for decades. And I will personally say, I believe it is wrong and it has meant that low-income women in this country have had, had an unequal access to health care for decades. And at some someday, I hope we overturn it. So there you are on the Hyde Amendment. Um, but this new effort was actually about all the work we do to prevent unintended pregnancy and to help prevent disease. Um, it was about preventing cancer screenings, birth control access, STD testing, and care. That's more than 90% of the services that Planned Parenthood provides every single uh, year. Um, and in fact, what I say, you know, I was actually just speaking in um, at, at an event in New York where we had a lot of protesters. Um, it was actually at a country club in uh, New York, and we were uh, kind of out in Westchester County, and folks with big, horrible signs and really very aggressive. Um, as one of the folks who said came to the breakfast, they said, thank goodness they were there. That way I knew where to turn um, to get into the Planned Parenthood event. <laughs> so they help us sometimes. But I really felt like rolling down the window and saying, you know, if those of you who are out here protesting really wanted to do something uh, to reduce the need for abortion in America, you'd be volunteering at a Planned Parenthood Health Center because we do more every single day to prevent unintended pregnancy and the need for abortion than any organization in the country and have for 96 years. So. But in any case, that was not the agenda of the House of Representatives. So they not only voted to completely end the family planning program, they also voted to completely end all funding for preventive care at Planned Parenthood, to ban Planned Parenthood from participating in federal programs. Um, and in fact, we were on the verge of a shutdown of the entire federal government, uh, and Speaker John Boehner went to the White House, to the Oval Office, um, literally, this, we were about, we were 24 hours away from an entire um, shutdown of the federal government. And John Boehner had one request for the President of the United States in order to avert a shutdown. And do you know what it was? It was to end funding for Planned Parenthood. I kid you not. And so um, the President said to John Boehner, nope, zero. It's not going to happen. And Speaker Boehner came back at him and said, this is what I need to get a budget deal through the House of Representatives. And the president said, no, John, it's not going to happen. And that moment will go down in the history of Planned Parenthood where the president of the United States drew the line for women and stood up for Planned Parenthood. We owe him an enormous debt of gratitude for that. <laughs> but what I will say is when the House voted to defund Planned Parenthood. It was like we say back home. It was like they dropped a match on dry kindling. You know, one in five women in America have been to Planned Parenthood. I swear I heard from every single one of them. <laughs> the, entire, the entire alumni of Planned Parenthood came out of the woodwork and began to organize. Um, and, you know, amazing things happened. Um, but the most amazing were the women uh, and young people who were patients of Planned Parenthood who came forward. Uh, women like Carolyn Smithers, uh, a patient who in her early 20s had her cervical cancer detected at a routine exam at Planned Parenthood. Uh, Carolyn now has two daughters in their 20s. As a result, they are now Planned Parenthood patients. She came to Washington three times to tell her story. This was happening all across the country. And at the end of the day, the United States Senate voted 58 to 42 to preserve the right of women to go to Planned Parenthood. Every single Democratic member of the United States Senate and five very brave pro-choice, pro-Planned Parenthood Republicans. And I just want to give an enormous shout out for Republicans in this country who are willing to buck their party and stand for Planned Parenthood. That means an enormous amount to us. But here are the, you know, in sum, here are the three things I think happened last year. One, the American people learned a lot more about who we are and what we do. Um, and that was incredibly important. The second is, 
our approval rating among the American people as a result grew. We gained 12 points in our approval rating. And at the end of the day, um, when they did the polling, as a result of the House's effort to defund us, the public supported Planned Parenthood. 69% of the American people supported Planned Parenthood. 10% supported the US Congress. So do the math. Um, it was very, very important. But the third and most important thing that happened is we gained an enormous uh, number of new activists. One and a half million brand new supporters of Planned Parenthood joined us, and half of them are young people, and they are all registered to vote. For me, um, and I guess we all sort of saw this play out in different ways, but I have three children, and my daughter Lily's already graduated from college. My twins, Daniel and Hannah, are in school. And um, my daughters are pretty typical type A, making 100, you know, doing everything. And my son is a little bit, you know, he's a little bit more laid back, um, kind of never had a care in the world, and has never been particularly involved in anything. Um, but I love him. Um, I love him as a mother loves her son. Anyway, in the midst of all this defunding effort of Planned Parenthood, I, um, I was, uh, you know, things were crazy. The House had voted to defund us. There was press everywhere. We were in the news every day. And uh, I'm racing frantically to get down to a rally in New York City in support of Planned Parenthood, thousands of people coming together. And I get a text on my cell phone, and it's from Daniel. Um, and it says, hey, Mom, I'm in a van with kids from college. He goes to college in western Pennsylvania. I'm in a van with kids from college, and we're going to Ohio to rally for Planned Parenthood. I love you, Daniel. I know. So it was that moment where my first reaction was that as a mother, like, wow, Daniel, that means so much to me. And my second reaction was, if Daniel's into this now, it is a movement across America, right? And we're not going backwards. Um, so I say that because I do think young people and women have become engaged like never before. Um, and I want to just stress a couple of things. I mean, we are still have enormous challenges. There were a lot of victories last year, but just this week, we've been in Texas trying to get an injunction to keep Governor Perry from shutting down the women's health program in Texas. We're fighting back legislation in Alabama that will virtually end access to abortion care in Alabama. Uh, and state after state, um, the assaults on women's health are real and they are present. And that's just this week. Um, I do think it's important to remember, though, that we are the big tent. Planned Parenthood. Uh, we are, we, women and young people come to us from every geography, every race, every you know, gender, economic background, and we are Republicans and independents and Democrats because we believe so strongly that women's health should not come with a political label in the United States of America. Amen. And when we organize, we can make change. Uh, and I know we referenced the Affordable Care Act, but one other issue I want to mention to you, and you probably followed that this year there was a there was a campaign by some to keep insurance coverage from covering birth control in America. This was uh, this was you know captivated I think the entire American people. More than 100,000 folks just at Planned Parenthood uh, wrote into the White House about the importance of this issue. Um, and as you may remember, um, uh, we. Sandra Fluke, the brave young uh, college uh, student at, at Georgetown Law uh, who was prevented from testifying about this issue before the US Congress. But the important thing to remember is at the end of the day, a few weeks ago, the President of the United States phoned me. Uh, he was phoning three people that morning. He was phoning the head of the Catholic Hospital Association, he was phoning the bishops, and he was phoning me. But he was really phoning you. He was phoning Planned Parenthood to say that for the first time, he was about to announce at the White House that for the first time in the United States of America, birth control will now be covered for all women in this country by their insurance plans, regardless of where they work, at no expensive copay and no expensive deductible. This is equity. This is fairness. This is historic. And it's all because of you and because of the organizing that folks did around the country. And I'll just end with this. I think it also happened 
because 96 years ago, Margaret Sanger went to jail uh, for handing out information about birth control. She believed so strongly that women should have access to the health care that they needed to plan their families. Uh, and as a result, life changed for women in America. So every single day, we just have to redouble our efforts and realize that change is hard, uh, change is slow, but it makes an enormous difference. And it is because of you and because of people like you around the country uh, that women and young people have access to care today uh, like never before. So I want to thank you so much for having me today. I know we're going to have a question and answer or conversation, and I look forward to it. Thanks so much. Thanks, Cecile. Thank you very much. It's really great of you to be spending a Sunday morning with us, too, by the way. Really appreciate that. It's a great cap to a fabulous week, I have to say. Oh, good, 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 good. Um, let's talk about strategy and leadership for just a few minutes. Mm -hmm. um, this church in 1989, under the guidance of our then-rector, George Regas, passed this amazing resolution. And by the way, everybody, we have copies here for you to have. It was passed in 1989. Like so many other social justice issues, it seemed as if we were putting cer certain things to bed, right? And now we've got this resurgence of anti-women political ideology. Can you reflect a little bit in your own leadership and your own uh, strategizing? What do you think is underneath this resurgence? And then I've got a follow-up question related to that. But, but in your own... Reflection. What do you think is going on? Well, first I want to say one thing about, uh, actually my mother um, used to quote Edna St. Vincent Millay, who had said, and this is a little bit of a, not exactly the right quote, but is, life isn't one thing after the other. It's the same damn thing over and over again. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> so if that gives you any comfort, I do think that, look, I think that the, um, it's not just women's issue. I mean, I think we're seeing in this country, obviously, things go in cycles in America. And I think we're seeing now, unfortunately, not just attacks on women, but attacks on gay and lesbian people, attacks on immigrants, uh, attacks on uh, labor uh, folks, uh, working people, and their right to organize. So I feel like this is all part of a mix. And, um, but... So we have to organize. We have to always be vigilant. Um, but I, um, I also think that this is very important to remember. The American people fundamentally believe in what we do, mm. and they believe in the right of women to have access to health care. Mm. So even though politicians may not get it, mm. people in America do. And I'm going to give you one, my best example from this last year. Some of you may have followed that in the state of Mississippi, there was a, um, an, um, an effort to amend the state constitution with a personhood amendment. Now, this amendment that would have essentially certainly made abortion, safe and legal abortion, illegal. It would have um, threatened potentially the access of women to commonly used forms of birth control, uh, in vitro fertilization, and the like. Now, Mississippi is a very, very conservative state by any polling measure. It, they would describe themselves uh, as a pro-life or anti-choice state. Um, and when we started that uh, ballot initiative, we were probably losing by 40 points. But at the end of the day, the folks in Mississippi, voters in Mississippi of every political stripe, overwhelmingly voted down the personhood amendment, okay? And that was because people organized, but it also was because fundamentally people believe that women in this country should have access to health care. And so I don't want us to think that because politicians are trying to take these rights away, that they aren't fundamentally supported by people all across America. Um, I, I, re I really appreciate you invoking your mother again. I loved her, and everybody in this room loved her. Um, 
Thank and, you. And one of my questions, if we had longer, and you, you must come back so we can have more time, would just be to talk about times when she, uh, her spirit visits you as a leader and mm -hmm. encourages you, et cetera. So, and, and if you want to weave any of that into your response to these next two questions, our time is, is running. Uh, but um, I'm assuming that your vision uh, and correct me if my assumption is wrong, that your vision is kind of uh, twofold. One, leading us to the next presidential election, and then what happens with Pan Planned Parenthood afterwards. If you could just kind of talk about what your immediate tr uh, strategy is between now and November, and then what your vision is for, and then if you have any more um, stories to tell about your mama, we'd love to hear them. <laughs> I've got a million of those. Uh, well, one, she would be so thrilled we're doing this. This is I. I feel like I carry her with me every day, because um, you know it's interesting. I have I have three children, as I said, and I think she really became the older she got and in the end end of her life, she became even more um, committed to women's health and women's rights, because she couldn't believe that her daughter. But more importantly, her granddaughters were going to have to fight the same battles over again. Um, so now I, I, I want to say what respond is the president of the Planned Parenthood Action Fund. And that's the organization through which we do political organizing and advocacy and support candidates. Um, it's fascinating to me, and I'm, obviously you've been, you see it out there in California. It is the gender gap, I believe, is going to determine uh, mm. who the next president of the United States is. Mm. Um, women and young people are going to be essential. Um, and I think what we're seeing is, I mean, again, this conversation about whether it's a real war on women. We have never seen, certainly not in my lifetime, as aggressive an assault on women's access to care. And again, we're not talking about choice here. We're talking about basic access to cancer screenings, um, to birth control, to family planning services. Women get this. Uh, and I, so for me and for on the Planned Parenthood Action Fund side, we know that Planned Parenthood, women trust us. Uh, they trust us with their health care, and they trust us when we talk about issues that matter to them and their families. And so we are going to have, and we have a lot of work to do, I think, to educate women in America about what's at stake for ourselves, but again, most importantly, for our daughters and our sons. Mm -hmm. Got it. Um, well, uh, I would, whoops. Oh. You'll come back? Great, oh good. Um, I'm, I'm watching the clock, and uh, now's the time that we need to bring Sherry in so that she can Great. say something, and then you and she can field some questions before we turn into a pumpkin at 11 o'clock here, okay. uh, our time. Terrific. Okay? So, everybody, um, I wanted to introduce to you uh, Sherry Bonner, who is... Um, her dedication to health care has been demonstrated by over 23 years of working for Planned Parenthood. She began her career with the organization in San Diego and now serves as the president and CEO of Planned Parenthood Pasadena and San Gabriel Valley, where she's been for the past seven years. She is also the chair of the National Board of Planned Parenthood CEOs and serves on the board of the statewide Planned Parenthood Advocacy Board, which worked to help us defeat the past three parental notification ballot initiatives, as well as the L.A. County Planned Parenthood Action Fund Board. She is a member of All Saints Church, I am very proud to say, and she lives in Pasadena with her husband Mark and their 15-year-old son Michael, who attends LaSalle High School in, the, in Pasadena and will celebrate his confirmation here with us on, um, on Saturday, May 5th. Will you please warmly welcome my friend, Sherry Bonner. Welcome. <clears throat> Yeah, let me get my notes. Cecile, can you see me? I think I was hiding from you before. Um, now I can. I, okay. Hi. <laughs> Hi. Well, I am so proud of Cecile Richards, who is the head of our national organization, and she exemplifies the values that are, are shared 
by our Reverend Ed Bacon, that of compassion um, and non-judgmental treatment of people and inclusion. Um, and that's what Planned Parenthood is about, and that's what All Saints is about. Um, it's a perfect match for me. It's a perfect match for our son, who you heard is going to be confirmed in a couple weeks and has been part of the youth group here and acolytes. And uh, I love it because I know that he is in a safe, non-judgmental place. So I, I couldn't be happier to bring those two parts of our lives together. Uh, <laughs> We've been hearing a lot about politics and what's happening in Washington, D.C., and sometimes it just seems like that's where the decisions are being made, and that's where many of the decisions are being made. But there is a real world, and the real world is people who come into our health centers every day. Um, we got a letter from a woman uh, just a couple weeks ago, and she had been into our health center for birth control, and as part of her visit, we did um, our usual well woman exam and determined that she had a lump on her throat. And so her letter that she brought in to us told us how thankful she was to us because we had, um, she had been sent to a cancer specialist and had thyroid cancer. And so she was very uh, pleased that she was going to be able to live the next 40 years with her, with her loving family. So... As we think about the work that Planned Parenthood does and the doors that we open for people to birth control, uh, we're also uh, providing a wide array of services for women that because we're, for most of our patients, we're their only source of health care unless they go to the emergency room. Um, we are detecting uh, cancers and things, blood pressure, high blood pressure, things that, um, that then they can go get that care that they need. So, um, so that, you know, that's who Planned Parenthood is. And as we think about this uh, locally, uh, many of you know that Planned Parenthood has been in this community since 1933, long time. We have a, the health center that we have up Lake, it's stone's throw away, uh, has just been remodeled, completely remodeled. So we have a beautiful, um, gracious, uh, clean, well-lit place for patients who, um, for, for one in five women, you probably know those women, or maybe you've been one of those women, uh, can come and get the services that they need. And we are also in the schools here in the uh, in Pasadena and throughout the San Gabriel Valley, teaching much needed, comprehensive, medically accurate uh, information about sexuality and relationships. So that's um, that's who we are here at Planned Parenthood in this area. And Cecile talked about the challenges that we see in um, Texas and, and Alabama, which are. Um, really, really very difficult challenges and very concerning in the country. And what I know is that those states look to us. They look to California for hope and inspiration. And, but we have our challenges in California here too. In fact, we are turning away 13,000 women every year for basic birth control because we don't have providers to provide that. Um, we have a couple of bills that we're sponsoring here in California, and we are going to have, we have some thank you letters for the people who are legislators who have uh, sponsored those for us, and so we'd love for you to sign those. Um, but mostly what I wanted to, to say is that what we know is that, is that faith is compassion. It's a political football right now, faith, but we know in this church that that's not what it is, that it's about protecting and looking out for women and their health. So thank you so much for, I know many of you are donors and supporters, and so I thank you, and um, I'll, I'll, I'll see you at church. <laughs> Thanks so much. Thanks, Sherry. Before we open it to questions, I just want to make a plug for Planned Parenthood. There's a lot of material over here. If you're not on the mailing, on the email blast for Planned Parenthood, please do so. Uh, they are very attentive, keep us um, apprised of what we need to be doing. Uh, whenever I get an email blast from either Sherry or Cecile, I do what they tell me to do. <laughs> Because I think it's wise. I know it's. I know it's. I know it's wise. Um, so uh, don't leave here today without giving them your email address, 
and um, make sure you give them some money as well. So we have some uh, we have uh, um, microphones coming to you. We have just a few minutes which, in which we can engage Cecile and Sherry. So raise your hand and we'll get it to you. There's one behind you. Two behind you. Yeah, thanks. Um, I just, is this on? Go ahead. Oh, wow. Okay. Um, I just want to say that I found uh, through a friend, I'm in school right now, um, an amazing video on YouTube about different is normal. I don't know if you're familiar. But it's, a, it's basically a, it's sponsored by Planned Parenthood. And it's an amazing little video targeted towards uh, children who are entering adolescence and you know, beginning to deal with what that entails. And I was so inspired by it. And I was just wondering about oh, the different uh, campaigns that Planned Parenthood has out there. This is so accessible and so powerful for a young kid who's right. just beginning to explore. So um, I just want to acknowledge <clears throat> that I really appreciated it. And is that Good. a campaign that you have, Different is Normal? It's not a campaign. And, and Sherry, I don't know if there's anything you want to say locally. Um, I think what we, <clears throat> does, she, does Sherry want to say something? I can't see her from here, so. She's coming. Do I see? Is it, is it a, but it was a nationally produced uh, YouTube? I actually can't remember where it was yes. produced the first time. But yeah, it's sure a nationally uh, produced video, and it's part of the work that we do um, from an education perspective to uh, help young people be able to navigate this very complex world that they're living in right now uh, where they're bombarded with media messages. And what we know about young people is that they're accessing their information on the Internet and, and, you, and YouTube particularly. My son's on that all the time. So, uh, so thank you. We have different ways that we sort of package that information about sexuality education, and that's certainly one that has gotten a lot of traction. Thanks for bringing that up. Um, and I'll just um, add to that. So just from the national perspective, I think this is, it's, it's interesting, as I think was referenced earlier, we now, last, I think last month we had 4 million visits to our website. And a lot of these are young people who um, really are trying to learn about, and they're just, you know, they are adolescents, and they just want to know that they're normal. And I think a lot of the, the work we do and the tremendous education work that's happening there in the San Gabriel Valley is just helping young people navigate what is a very, very um, con often confusing time of life, as, and as Sherry said, with sometimes with not all the support that they need. So, thank, and I really, I just want to shout out Sherry's work. They do an amazing job um, there in Pasadena and San Gabriel. Um, I, I'm curious ab about how you're organized uh, in terms of the two different organizations of Planned Parenthood. Parenthood. Um, uh, tell us a little bit, I think, well, any, anything else you want to t talk about it in terms of kind of the medical educational work that's done with Planned Parenthood and also the political side, if you could just flesh that out a little bit more. Well, so I'll say, and, and, and Sherry may want to say, you know, Planned Parenthood, we're in every um, state in America, so it's a big organization, and uh, we are, have separate, uh, separately incorporated affiliates who provide health care every day uh, through bricks and mortar clinics. Increasingly, though, we work in partnership with at the national level and at the state level to take best practice, practices, many of which are started in California, which has been, is such a leading leading area for our healthcare delivery, and then try to replicate that, those wonderful programs uh, across the country. So we have one major national organization that's a 501c3. We have a 501c4, as we mentioned, through which we do, we lobby Congress, we do political work, we endorse candidates, uh, and then we have a federal PAC that actually contributes to uh, and does endorse federal candidates. And there's a very similar organization there at the state level several affiliates in the state of California alone, and they also come together uh, through something called PPAC, which is how they do their political and advocacy work. And so you'll we try be, to cover the waterfront. So you'll be running some kind of truth squads as the lies get even worse as we get closer to November, I hope, to equip people to combat um, some really despicable political advertising that's going to go out there that will be dissing and discounting everything you do. 
Yeah, no, it's going to be a very tough year. Uh, look, I think what we're going to see this year, unlike anything we've ever seen, is millions and millions of dollars of corporate money because, of course, the Supreme Court decision that now has allowed corporations to spend unlimited uh, money, which is very hard to track. And so this is a year in which grassroots organizing, talking to our, you know, women, talking to women and Planned Parenthood people, talking to Planned Parenthood people is going to be incredibly important because there's not going to be any way to combat or match the kind of resources that are coming in um, uh, in states already uh, across America. Good. We have a question here for you, Cecile. Great. So uh, in terms of our communication strategies, being able to use the messaging we're getting from Planned Parenthood, um, I wrote a blog on the Huff Post a couple of weeks ago, got over 750 comments, and what that provided yep. us was the opportunity to be in dialogue and put a faith base on the women's health argument. So I would love to hear more from you about communication strategy moving forward, and I also want to commit myself and everyone in this room, I'm committing all y'all. So <clears throat> that was a perfect question, and I appreciate what you, both what you've done and what you're working to, because I do think, and I mean, this was, I learned this in Texas years ago, uh, again, working with clergy there, is that it was so important for our supporters to hear from a faith perspective that we commit to this work because of our faith. Uh, it, it, it is not, in dis, it's not despite it, it is because of it. And it is so important because Folks need to have that reassurance, and they need to hear these, um, have this conversation uh, in a faith-based context. The other thing I want to say is I have never seen the kind of explosion in social media. I mean, years as an organizer, starting as a labor organizer, been a community organizer uh, for really my entire life, the ability of uh, those of us uh, here today and across the country to get our stories out has never been greater. And you know, I'll, I'll say we saw that, we've seen that in this last year, where literally hundreds of thousands of people have told their stories online, gone on, whether it's Facebook or Twitter. And to me, it's a great equalizer because it's very hard to get sometimes to get the human face on uh, the work that we do. So I wanna encourage you, and the great thing is, you can obviously write your story there in Pasadena, and it travels across the country and often across the world. So the power of social media, I do believe, is going to be essential to us to really put a human face on the kinds of attacks that are going on against women, against young people, and against their access to care. So thank you. Thanks, Cecile. <laughs> Um, we have to go to church now. Oh, but good for you. We, want, we don't want to go to church without you really feeling how supportive we are of you in your leadership and for Planned Parenthood. Thank you so much for being with us this morning. It's been a great delight. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you so much.